RX Television on RXMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit SpeciesNutrition.com. Try the all new Amino Evolved, now available at SpeciesNutrition.com. Also available right now on the website, Testalize, back in stock. You've all been asking about it for quite some time. It is back indeed right now at SpeciesNutrition.com. 30 minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IMDb Pro is the latest news. The big news today, Dave, new Olympia qualification scenarios. You just recorded a video. It's going to be on rsmuscle.com by the time this video posts. But just give our viewers a little bit of an insight as far as the new changes and what you discuss in that video. Absolutely. Now, I just wanted to say also, Sid, um, there's a uh, discount code I want to give out to all our RX Muscle listeners, Amino25, and that will give you 25% off the uh, new Amino Evolved at SpeciesNutrition.com. So you can check that out. But uh, yeah, the uh, I've been saying uh, that for the past, and it hasn't been that long. Sometimes I've said things for a long time, but probably the past, you know, maybe a year. I, every time I go to the Olympia now, the Olympia has got too many people. I, it, the Olympia was always the elite of the elite, you know, 10, 12, maybe 15 guys the most. You know, nowadays you got like 20, 35, 40 bikini competitors. You got 45 men's physique guys on stage. It's the Olympia. It's not, you know, it's not the Little League uh, World Series. So I think that we have to, uh, I, th I felt that there needed to be a way to eliminate some of the people, just have the best of the best. And then they pretty much have done that. They've, you know, released some new rules that have curved it back a little bit. I still think they can go more, but it's a good move in the right direction. You know, and we'll have to see how it works out this year. And maybe next year they'll make it a little more severe. If there's more than 25 shows now uh, in a division, like let's say Bikini has 35 shows for the year. Uh, the, everyone who wins doesn't qualify anymore. Only the uh, top five Olympia finishers will qualify for next year. If you're a previous Olympia uh, winner, you'll, you'll, you're automatically qualified. And then they're going to take, um, I believe it was 15 more people, um, but it's going to be a point system. So if you're just winning a show is not enough to qualify. If you win, however, you'll get a lot of points. So the top 20, uh, it's the top 20 point getters, excuse me will go to the Olympia in addition to the top five uh, from the year before in the Olympia. So the most people you can get in a class would be 25, which I still think is too much. But I think it, it's a definite move in the right direction. It's going to limit the amount of people. We're going to only have the best of the best there. So winning the Mr. You know, Aloha you know, Hawaii Classic might only you know, net you so many points. You might have to win another show or play second in another show to qualify for the Olympia. It's not going to just be handing out, you know, Olympia invites to every single person who wins a show. Now, if there's under 25 shows for the year, which is the case with, men's, with the Men's Open, uh, at this point we don't have more than 25, it's, still, it's pretty much old rules. It's, it's, if you win a, if the top five at the Olympia qualify, if you win a show, you qualify, and the top three point getters, it used to be the top five point getters, top three pointers, second, third, fourth, fifth placers uh, will qualify as well. Still, in my mind, too many people, but much better. Let's get into questions. If you want to join us, you can join us on the Muscle Central Forum on rxmuscle.com, our Instagram page, Facebook, Twitter, as well as on YouTube. Let's go first to Jason and Taylor Training. Now, before I ask this question, Dave, I've heard different things. Big Rami, 100% confirmed for the Arnold Classic, uh, Columbus, Ohio? It's a good question. I don't know. Uh, until they give out the invites. You know, in December, when they always do, uh, I, I don't think anyone's confirmed. Uh, I would like to see Rami. I think it's a good move. But, you know, you come in second at the Olympia, he might be thinking, you know what, let me save it up and try to win the Olympia next year. So, I don't know. Uh, I, there's, there's, there's some rumblings and some, some rumors. What have you heard, Sid? Sometimes you're more on top of things than I am. I, I've, heard, I've heard both things. I've heard definitely. I've heard well, kind of thinking about it. So, uh, but Jason Diller training, he did want to know that if we – are in fact if if Rami is in fact going to be competing there, if we could do a versus episode between him, him and Cedric McMillan. And my answer to that is that Dave, did you know that I think three of the last four episodes of versus have included Cedric McMillan? I, I you know I was looking at the YouTube channel. And I saw that that uh, everyone wants to see Cedric you know against everyone else, and uh, I thought it was pretty funny. I, I think a good matchup would be uh, Nasser El Somebody versus Big Rami. You know that might mm. be a good versus to do. I'll have to look into that. Egyptian Titans. There you go. So let's go to the 100 when squatting. I feel the pump and the burn in my hamstring and glutes. 
I'm sure my form is on point. Leg extensions really pump my quads. Should I be worried about the, and I, I don't know what he means by this, by the famous squat? I, I mean, I don't know. I, I think most people don't have enough glute. And when people say they work their hamstrings in their squat, and they do a little bit, but it's a lot of adductor, which is the inner thigh. Now, the inner thigh muscle, when it's squeezed against the other quad muscle on the side poses, definitely makes, creates that hang. So um, it's good to have big adductors. You know, I, that was a lot of my leg mass back in my uh, heyday was from the, the huge adductors I had. And when I would stand to the side, my legs looked enormous. And from behind, they looked enormous. And from the front, they look good because you get that big, girthy inner thigh. I see a lot of guys on stage who have good quads, but they don't have enough adductor, and it, and it makes their legs look shallow. And I think so. If you're feeling it in your glutes and you're feeling it in that adductor region, that's you're doing the right job. You do, good job. Keep going with it. Let's go to actually, he has a second question, and it's about the keto diet. Your opinion on doing a big smoothie with fruits and a cheat meal to get some vitamins and micronutrients since the rest of the week is pretty bland? Well, I mean, I mean, that's what you want to eat. I, I prefer to go to get a burger and fries or, you know, a, pl a plate of pasta or something like that. I mean, I have, I have my clients obviously taking uh, V Mineralize and uh, Omega Lyse, which is going to give you all the vitamins, minerals, and essential fatty acids you need already. I actually, I'm a big advocate of a product called Juice Plus too, which is your, your uh, vegetable and fruit extracts. So, I mean, uh, drinking a, a high sugar drink, you know, smoothie, thinking that you're getting, you know, phytonutrients is probably uh, hopeful Alex. at best. Hopeful at best. So, uh, I think that it's uh, took a wing and a prayer. I, I really, if you want to justify having a smoothie because of that, because you really like it, then do it. But uh, personally, when I do my cheat meal, I don't really waste it on sugary calories like that, on, on in drinks. I, I try to eat food. I'm so like, into my food, you know, that I just want to eat whatever, you know, is on my mind, whether it be a sushi buffet or McDonald's or whatever. Zay King, Dave, I hate this show, yada, yada, yada. What do you think about prednisone and the side effects on muscle building? Well, I mean, prednisone is a catabolic steroid. I mean, it does the exact opposite of what anabolic steroids do. It breaks down muscle tissue. It raises blood sugar. It causes, you know, uh, abdominal fat deposition. It, 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 it suppresses the immune system. It's, it's bad stuff. You know, you don't want to have to take it, but obviously some people who have chronic inflammation and autoimmune disorders, you don't have a choice. So it's, not the, it's a terrible drug for bodybuilding, if you want to know the truth. Alex McGee, Dave, the best way to train when coming off cycle. Keep looking heavy, lower volume, increase intensity. What do you think? Um, I always tell people, don't purposely lift light, you know, just because you think, oh, I'm off. I, you know, I know guys that the day they stop their last shot, they're like ba barely going to the gym. I'm like, do you realize that the stuff that you've been taking for the last, you know, eight months is going to be in your system for four more weeks, probably at least? So take advantage of it. I tell people, train the, norm the way you normally train. You're not going to try to set records, but train hard, push in the gym. And do it for as long as you can. I mean, at some point, you, your body's hormone set levels are going to drop down, and you might not feel so good. But I know a lot of guys. I always train right through, you know, my off season and an off period, off cycle period, I should say, with not a problem. It wasn't until like the last couple of weeks that I started losing a little strength and endurance. But you know, by then it was almost time to go back on. So I, I, I wouldn't personally change anything purposely unless you just legitimately feel, you know, weaker or have less endurance or or, or less recovery. Kirk Moore, what can you do if you're having trouble eating after heavy leg and back days? You drink shakes. That's what I always do. After a heavy leg day, I couldn't stomach food. I would just gulp down a huge shake. Usually try to take a nap or at least lay on the couch, watch some TV, relax. Usually about two, three hours later, I started feeling good and I, and, and I was able to eat my normal food. Um, but yeah, don't try, to eat, don't try to jam food down after a big leg workout. You'll probably want to puke it. Let's go to Lee Axon. Uh, we haven't gotten this question in quite some time, so we prize it. My question is regarding stretch marks. Are they the result of too much fat in the body or too much muscle, and how can they be commented? Well, I mean, stretch marks happen in fat people. They happen in really muscular people. I never had a stretch mark on my body, and I remember the first one I got was along this little vein I had going along my shoulder here, and I'm like, I, I guess I'm getting bigger. <laughs> you know, so... What it is is, you know, the the, tish, the skin is made of elastic you know, elastic tissue and collagen connective tissue, 
And what happens is when the muscle, when the muscle grows too fast, the skin gets stretched too fast, doesn't have time to accommodate, and you get rips in the skin. And the first stretch marks you see on your body are always these red, you know, almost look like raw looking, you know, um, cuts almost they look like, or, or abrasions. And that's because the skin is actually tearing apart. That heals up eventually. Over time, those uh, stretch marks will turn white and kind of blend in with your skin. You can still see the kind of like the pattern on them, but you don't really see the coloring anymore, the discoloration, I should say, anymore. It comes to the territory. There's nothing you can do about it. You can rub vitamin E and all the other crazy coconut oil, all the things that you can possibly do on there. It won't, it won't heal it up faster. It's not going to alleviate it. It won't stop it from happening. It's just a result of getting more muscular. I've had them. They faded. Usually, I, I got them like on my shoulders, a little my chest, around my, uh, my probably, my, I don't know if... Yeah, I guess around my like oblique area of my waist, uh, a little bit on my legs. But once again, they kind of faded so much, I can't even see them anymore, to be honest with you. Takar81, Dave currently taking DMSO and Tiger Bomb pre-workout for tendonitis and DMSO and Voltaren post-workout. Do you suggest any other ointment for tendon pain? You know, I was never into ointments. I, I never felt they worked at all. I, I, to be honest, I've tried a lot of them because I, you know, I had arthritis in my shoulders. I just, I just didn't feel res relief from them. Some people tell me they get relief. I say, you know what? If you feel better, take it. It can't, it's not going to hurt you. When you start putting some of these uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, however, on Voltaren, uh, you know, they, sometimes they have this Voltaren cream. You've got to be careful with those because those do inhibit inflammation so severely that it can inhibit muscle growth as well. Because uh, a little bit of inflammation is good. Excessive inflammation, not so good. Brooks Clark, do you think taking a low dose of Cialis pre-workout two to three times a week is beneficial and any negative health ramifications with this drug? You know, this is my take on the whole Cialis, Viagra before you train thing. Um, why was Cialis and, and Viagra created? The answer is to increase erections in, in the penis. Okay? It increases blood flow to the genitalia specifically. Why it does this, we don't know. Cialis and Viagra were, were blood pressure meds, or at least they were slated to be blood pressure meds, and they were doing chronic and, and when they were doing clinical testing on them, people were getting erections. And they're like, I don't know, what's, what the hell is going on here? And then they realized it causes localized nitric oxide release in, in the genitalia which obviously increases blood flow there, which uh, will help you get an erection. Uh, how that will help your muscles in the gym, I have no idea. Um, I think people just think because it causes increased blood flow to the penis, it's gonna happen to all the muscles in your body, and that's just not the case. Uh, Melling muscle, any thoughts on water retention differences between long and short ester testosterone compounds leading into a show? I've always been advised to switch to short esters closer to show day to quote, hold less water, but I have a hard time reasoning it, especially when using diuretics. Yeah, you, what you're saying is very logical, obviously. You're, you're asking some valid scientific questions and, and you're getting some bro science answers and, and they're not driving with you and I, they don't jive with me either. Um, to be honest with you, holding a little water, you know, a couple weeks out is a good idea probably. It protects the joints, it makes you stronger. Uh, walking around super dehydrated is, is a very catabolic state of being. Also, you, you, you can't really lift very much when, you, when you're dehydrated because the joints are just rubbing and, and grinding on each other. So I don't have a problem with water retention. I hate test propionate. I'm personally allergic to it in some capacity because when I take it, I get welts. It hurts. I can't even move my leg. I get fevers from it. So I don't like it, and I don't use it on any of my clients. I, I always recommend testosterone cypionate or an anthate or even some, a little bit of sustenone, even though it does have some propionate in it. It's not as bad. It's a very small amount. Um, water retention is, is, is a factor of how many grams of carbs you're eating too. A lot of people don't realize that. You put someone on a zero or a low, very low carb diet and they don't hold any water. You could take any drug in the book, okay, and you will not hold water. That's just the way it works. So, you know, what do you do at the end before a show? Well, that's what we use water restriction and diuretics for. That's to pull that out. So I, I, don't, I, think, it, I don't think it's necessary to, um, to be, you know, watching your sodium intake and, and being so concerned. With, with that. I, I just think it's, uh, I think you're asking for trouble and don't worry about the esters. All steroids do the same thing. Some make you hold a little bit of water, but that water doesn't mean fat. And that's why we dehydrate ourselves, you know, a day before with diuretics, water restriction to a certain point, uh, eating the right foods, 
and filling up and, uh, and putting the right, the right kind of diuretics in. I think that's important. So if you have the protocol down, you won't even be thinking about this. Getting some good questions here. You may want to think a few seconds before this next one, Dave, from Fernando Arroyo, the dumbest bodybuilding myth you've ever heard. I don't know. Yeah, probably, I, I can't think, as I've heard so many stupid things, and I hear it on a regular basis, but uh, I remember I was backstage when I was a kid at a show, kid, I was probably in my early 20s, and uh, this guy's breath just reeked, and I'm like, and he was, I don't know, we were talking about something, and I guess everyone around him realized how he stunk, this guy, and uh, we, we were, I was saying, yeah, I said, you know, I, I, I said, I heard, I heard some guys don't brush their teeth, and this guy said, yeah, I don't brush my teeth, sodium, sodium fluoride in there, that's going to make you hold water, I'm like, do you think that the sodium that you're brushing your teeth with is going to somehow get into your body and make you hold water? You're not even drinking anything. You know, I, I, it sounded ludicrous to me. And the guy's breath was just like dragon breath. So I was like, you know what? You should go brush your teeth <laughs> or chew a piece of gum <laughs> because it can't get much worse than this. I said, you're certainly not going to look any worse than you do right now. So that, that was one of a million different stupid things that I've heard people say. I've heard other people say, don't take a shower. You know, you don't even rinse off the morning of the show because your body's going to retain fluid from the water from the shower. I'm like, these people are out of their freaking minds. I must be in an insane asylum. I used to say to myself backstage sometimes. <laughs> you know, how about this? You watching at home, what is the dumbest bodybuilding myth you've ever heard? Comment below in the YouTube comment section and we'll try to answer as many of them as we possibly can. Let's go to... Killard, uh, Dave, your thoughts on post-workout carbs. I currently ingest 20 grams of carbs uh, via dates. So you dates after workouts. How many grams should I consume to gain a maximum insulin release? I'm 150 pounds. Yeah, you know, we're not, you're not really having the carbs to, to cause insulin release, although you do get some insulin release. And ironically, post-workout, and we've mentioned this before, when you exercise, your body produces what's called GLUT4 receptors on your muscle cells. What GLUT4 receptors enable the body to do is absorb glucose without the need for insulin. So post-workout, because you have all these GLUT4 receptors, when you eat a carb meal, you actually eat less, you actually release less insulin because you don't need the insulin as much because you have these GLUT4 receptors to absorb the glucose molecules without insulin necessary. So you actually have a lower insulin response post-workout. So taking a huge amount of carbs or simple carbs into spike insulin is not necessarily something you need to do. Also, we know insulin doesn't build muscle. All insulin does is store carbs as glycogen. So what we're really trying to do post-workout is re-glycogenate the muscle. Now, it's much easier to re-glycogenate the muscle after your weight train because of the fact of what I just mentioned earlier, you're producing these GLUT4 receptors. So don't confuse things. Um, don't make them more complicated than they are. Remember, carbs are not necessary for the repair process. It's just a nice idea to get them into the muscle so that we have more glycogen for tomorrow's workout. Let's go to Stephen Almendinger. It's a question that we get fairly often, but it is an important one. How frequently should you get blood work done and what is the most important thing to look at aside from your testosterone levels? I would say every six months if you're on a cycle. If you're not, maybe once a year is probably okay. Uh, I have a list of blood work that I do send out to people. If they, if they email me at huge285 at AOL.com, I'll send you the blood work that I think you uh, should go get. When you do go to the doctor, it's a whole list. It involves vitamin D3 and B12 and your whole hormonal panel, your thyroid panel, your liver function and kidney function, your cholesterol levels, your white and red blood cells, all that jazz. And, uh, and it, you know, it's, it's very comprehensive, but it gives you a good, I guess you could say, uh, insight into what your body's chemistry is doing and, and how healthy you are. Sultana Pisa, Dave, I wanted to know what your thoughts are on fasting to improve insulin sensitivity, not intermittent fasting, just a once a week, 20 to 24 hour fast. Yeah, I, I don't think you need to fast for 24 hours, to be honest with you. I think you're better off fasting for 12 hours out of every day and only eating 12 hours out of the day. That's if you're not a bodybuilder, for health purposes. If you're a bodybuilder, it's probably not a good idea to, to, to do fasting every single day where you, you know, because that's a long period to go 12 hours without eating anything, you know, because now your body's going to start getting catabolic. But if you're like at me and you don't care and you're not looking to put any more muscle on, you want to just be healthy, I try to do like four or five days of, of 12 hour fast at least. Um, if I go to bed at 10, you know, if I stop eating my last meal at like 10 o'clock at night, 10.30, 
I won't eat in the morning till 10, 30, 11, or whatever. I try to go 24 hours without eating anything. And if you do that for continuously for three weeks in a row, you'll see a tremendous uh, drop in total body toxicity. You'll feel better. Uh, you know, your body will process protein better. Your, your blood values for kidney and liver function will improve. So, you know, it's, it's entirely up to you. I wouldn't be, I don't, I don't like a 24-hour fast. It's too severe. Macking 1977, your opinion on never coming off test, just cruise on low dose 200 mg, then blasting high dose, say for six to eight weeks. Um, I, I'm not a big advocate of that. Uh, you guys know I'm a bigger advocate of taking consistent amounts of, of testosterone, whether it be a, a nice threshold amount, maybe it's 750 milligrams, 1,000 milligrams a week. Do that for you know, 18, 24 weeks, and then come off and give your body a, a break, you know, two weeks of HCG, two weeks of Clomin, and then maybe another four to six weeks off and clean it out, and then go back on. Now, if you're an older person and you want to go to hormone replacement therapy, what I would probably do is take a week or two off the drugs and then go right to your HCG Clomid, excuse me, right, go right to your HCG. If you want to do a little Clomid too after the HCG, two weeks of HCG, two weeks of Clomid, that's fine. And then you want to go back on your hormone replacement, I don't have a problem with that. But um, yeah, that's only in older people that are over the age of 45. T-Flex Bodybuilding, Dave, hate the show. Uh, I'm gonna shave his life for a bodybuilding show. Your view on creatine malate and how it differs from creatine, HCL, and monohydrate. All the research I've read, creatine monohydrate is still the gold standard in creatine, the most absorbable form of creatine you can consume. It's also the cheapest. You know, uh, Obviously, depending on whether you get something that's micronized or ultra-micronized like my Creolized product, it might be a little more expensive, but, but by and far, if you're looking to take creatine, creatine monohydrate is still the best bang up there for your buck. Um, it doesn't cost a lot, and it's actually very potent. Always, once again, look for micronized creatine so they mix better in solution. Natalie, 0312. Dave, I recently heard some artificial sweeteners spike your insulin levels. If that holds any truth, which ones? Um, we'll say, we'll say that again. Say it one more time. Wants to know that when he's recently, she recently heard that some artificial sweeteners oh, artificial spike sweeteners. insulin levels. If so, which ones? They don't really spike insulin. Some of them trick your body. If something tastes so sweet to your mouth, your body might think blood, uh, blood sugar levels are going to start going up and it might precipitate an insulin response. Usually it's very small. Now, if your blood sugars are really low and you get a very small spike of insulin, you're still going to get low blood sugar and you might feel a little shaky, cold sweats. Um, I'll tell you what, what does that. Quest protein bars do that, believe it or not. Certain ones. I know the cookies and cream one do, do, does it. If, you're low, if your blood sugar is already borderline low and then you, take a, 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 you, you eat one of those bars, you're going to go even lower. Because I think what it does is there's really very, almost no net carbs in there, but yet it tastes sweet. I think your body thinks you're eating food and it cranks some insulin out and then your blood sugar drops and there's nothing to raise it because your body's not eating any carbs. There's really no net carbs in, in the uh, Quest bar itself. And, and that can be a problem. Now, the good thing is that our bodies have counter-regulatory hormones like glucagon and cortisol, which will raise blood sugar by t converting amino acids into, uh, into glucose and or, in the case of uh, glucagon, taking stored glycogen and turning it into free glucose. Let's go to Wolf of Essex. Dave, I know the probability of pregnancy is low on cycle, but still possible. However, should I be concerned with fertility issues after my cycle? Also, do you think... I would be at increased risk to see birth defects from steroid use. I don't think you're going to see birth defects from steroid use. I don't, I don't personally think that the steroids you're injecting into the male body can affect the sperm cells. You know, some people beg, beg to differ. I, I, don't, I don't believe that. Um, I, if anything, it's a very minor effect. And I, I, don't, I don't, once again, I don't think it's an effect at all. But I'd like to see some studies on that. It's an interesting question. Uh, what, what was the first part of the question, Sid? Does he want to know? The first part of the first question telling? is... Um, uh, again, pro probability of pregnancy okay. low on a cycle is still possible. Should he be concerned with fertility issues after his cycle? You know, it, you would think that conventional wisdom would, would have me tell you, you know what, while you're on a cycle, don't worry about it. You're not going to get anyone pregnant. But that's not the case. There's been a lot of bodybuilders that have. So I would not use taking steroids as a method of birth control by any means. When you come off the steroids, however, you might be way more fertile. 
Okay, usually initially that doesn't happen. Initially, you're, you're, you're very low testosterone, you're not stimulating anything. But moving forward, if you have naturally good levels and they come back and you start producing sperm, within two to three months, you might, you might get someone pregnant. So you gotta be very careful. You know, Boston Lloyd did some kind of screwy interview where he was saying, you know, he took my protocol that I gave him, which he thinks is too conservative. Of course he would, because he wants to take a whole bottle of HCG a day. No one else does because it's too expensive. And, you know, he was foo-fooing it. And he said, oh, I got my girlfriend pregnant in two weeks and I was on cycle. But he was on like 2,000 milligrams of testosterone. And I've said this before. When you're taking super physiological dosages, pharmacological doses of testosterone above and beyond what, you know, normally people take, you sometimes become more fertile because this huge bolus of testosterone that's circulating in your bloodstream eventually passes through the testicles and stimulates those Sertoli cells to produce sperm. Um, that might be the case that could happen. So I don't want to say, yes, taking steroids is a good birth control because it's not. Jacked and juicy, better quality protein, chicken or turkey? Uh, I don't, I, you know, it's hard to tell. You know, obviously, um, turkey seems to be a little leaner than chicken, which means you might have a, a few more, you know, grams of amino acids or, and protein and or protein per, per chicken breast. So, it might be better uh, at building muscle, but I, I think they're about the same. Let's go to code. Code by the pound. Is it possible to inject stem cells directly into muscles to cause localized growth? I've never heard anyone mention this. You know, I, I um, was watching this interview with Wayne Dyer, and I think it's James Lipton. Uh, I might be it's Dr. Lipton. I don't know what the guy's first name is. I might be confusing him with the guy from the actor studio, but. They were doing this whole show on, on epigenetics, how our environment and our thoughts influence how our genes are expressed. And this guy said, you know, it's interesting how we, we have millions and millions of stem cells throughout our entire body, yet we don't know how to activate them we have to work. We have to inject them into body parts to, to, to work or to maybe believe they're working. And really, and Victor Priss, Dr. Victor Priss said this to me too, when I was trying to go for stem cells in my shoulders, he said to me, he goes, you know, you're... Your mental outlook on this procedure is way, way, way important on, on, the, on the outcome that you get, on the results that you get. So if you think like it's not going to work, it probably won't. If you think it will work, it, it might work. So mental thinking about what you want, okay, will activate these stem cells. Because there's always, we see all the time, we see um, these specials on TV. We read these books about people who had... Stage four terminal cancer, everyone wrote them off, the, the priest is in there giving them their, their last rites, and all of a sudden they wake up and, and, they, and over the next two or three weeks they, they start getting better and better and better and then the cancer spontaneously goes away. How is that possible? Because we have stem cells that can, that can do that. We have an immune system that can eat up the cancer. It's all a matter of believing that you could actually you know, beat cancer, that you can defeat this disease, believing in the fact that you have health intrinsically in your body and then activating those cells that will do this. So we, we can heal ourselves. I think we just don't believe we can heal ourselves. And believe me, I might sound a little bit more spiritually enlightened than anyone than some other people out there, but I'm obviously not because I didn't heal my shoulders. That's for sure. I had to go for a shoulder replacement. So I'm in the same boat you guys are. When you, when you think negative thoughts, when you, act, when you think about doubt, that's what your body acts on. It, it, it gives you more doubt. And, and so uh, you really have to be in a good mental place to, to heal yourself, and I think that's a problem. I think we all believe that we need to go to a doctor to be healed, and if we don't, then nothing happens, you know. We'll take a couple more questions. The first one, Jacob Fiato. Painless pumps immediately before training or sometimes afterwards also. What is the safest way to pin your chest? Um, sa safest way to do what to your chest? Sorry? I didn't hear, what, what do you want to do? To, what does this guy want to do to his chest safely? He wants to safely pin his oh, chest. Pin his chest, okay. Um, I, I don't think it matters. I've done it before and after when you take your, your shots of either Chris Clark synthesizer or painless pumps. I, I don't think it matters if you do it before or after a workout. I used to do it after the, 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 the body part because I felt when, when all that, when I put the, all that you know, oil in there, it just felt un, unnatural and I felt like I was, uh, I was holding back on my workouts. When I would do it after, I, it was like, kind of like the body part was done being trained. It, it, it didn't matter anymore. So I did it at night, but I know people that do it in the morning before they train. So, it, but it doesn't matter. That's the case. And a lot of people have asked me if I'm getting painless pumps back in at DatePalumbo.com. And the question, the answer is that is yes, they're on their way. I do still have a full stock of Chris Clark synthesized uh, pump and pose as well. So those are both in stock. 
Last question from the Atomic Beast Dave One. Your top fibrous vegetables every person, especially a bodybuilder, should have in their diets, such as broccoli, onions, etc. Uh, and then he goes excluding potatoes, question mark. Um, let's go with that one first, actually. I'm gonna answer it a different way. I'm gonna tell you what I eat on a regular basis, vegetable-wise, okay? I'm a big kale person, a lot of people know that. Kale, arugula salad, I like that. Um, I do uh, broccoli a lot, and I eat it raw. I break it up into pieces, I put it into my salad. I think it's got a tremendous amount of, of nutrient that, uh, density that way. I do like green beans, I don't know how much nutritional value they have, I just do like them, especially you know the fresh ones that are long and, and just barely steamed, you know, just barely cooked. Uh, what else do I like? Uh, I also do, I'm a big cucumber person, only if they're fresh. I've been eating, actually my garden has produced some, some really weird round cucumbers that are yellow. Uh, and they look like they shouldn't taste good, but they, they're amazing. I don't know, I'm sure there's some gardeners out there who'll tell me what variety that is. I'm into that. Uh, cauliflower is really good too. Uh, cauliflower, broccoli, I kind of mix up, you know, go back and forth with those, those guys. I'm not into onions. I don't like onions. My wife goes crazy with the, the breath and the smell of it. Same thing with garlic. We try in my house. We try to avoid garlic and, and onions, which is a which is almost like a curse for an Italian person. But, but the, once in a while, when we got to eat, you know, at the Italian restaurant, we'll get a little bit of that. But um, I avoid that. But that's pretty. I'm, I'm broccoli, cauliflower, green beans. I, oh, I, I do use a mixed vegetable bag of mixed vegetables um, that will have like some um, green peppers in it, some uh, bamboo shoots. Uh, what else is in there? Um, red peppers, bamboo shoots. It's like an Asian mix, <laughs> and uh, water chestnuts and pea pods. That's those. So what I try to do is I mix it up. I don't always eat the same thing with vegetables because I think that each vegetable has a different variety of stuff in it. The truth is that most people overcook their vegetables to death, and, and all the vitamins come out of it. So I try to eat as much raw stuff as possible. The good thing about frozen vegetables is that they're not really cooked yet, so you can kind of put them in the microwave just to frost them essentially, you know, just, just so they heat it up and, and they're perfect, you know, they're perfect crunchiness. They still have some good vitamins left in them. Uh, canned vegetables are the worst. The second part of his question was about eating too many vegetables, again, excluding uh, potatoes. During prep, could that hinder weight loss? Um, oh yeah, eating too much of anything will hinder weight loss. I mean, you can eat too much, uh, uh, you know, I know people that drink too much diet soda and they get headaches from it. So too much of anything is no good, but vegetables do contain carbs, especially the yellow ones, the red ones. Uh, anything that's not green has carbs in it. And then you, know, then you have your starchy vegetables like peas and corn, also a lot of carbs in it. Even broccoli has a lot of carbs in it. Broccoli has way more carbs than green beans and asparagus. I have most of my, my athletes use green beans and asparagus because the, and spinach because they're very, very low in carbs. So you got to be careful. There's no such thing as unlimited food in a diet. Plus, you don't want to bulk up your diet with a lot of empty calories because it stretches your stomach out, which makes you hungry all the time. That's going to do it for this episode of Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Again, on speciesnutrition.com, Amino Evolved and Testalyze back in stock. If you want 25% off Amino Evolved, hit the promo code Amino25. Again, only at speciesnutrition.com. For Dave Palumbo and our producer, Tyler Shore, doing a great job as always. I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next week.